So, do you all remember how a few years ago Jasper RLZ made a video on water effects in various Nintendo games? And at some point I just decided that I had to make videos on how to do similar things to that in Game Maker. And then, uh, around that time, uh, he also made a video on tune shading in The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. And, of course, I then felt obligated to follow that up with a series of how to do tune shading in Game Maker. Well then, I have both good and bad news for you, which is that his latest hit is all about deferred rendering in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and in particular how it relates to a specific glitch where the tune shading on Link appears to vanish at certain points. Ever since that came out, the subject of deferred rendering has been living rent-free in my head, and I can tell the only way I'm going to get rid of it is if I make videos on covering it in Game Maker, so that's what we're going to do. So if you have not yet watched the video that Jasper made on the subject, I would highly recommend you do that because it's very good. I will have links to it in the video description and probably in a pop-out card. And before I get into writing any code, uh, let's talk about exactly what deferred rendering is. So, everything that I've covered in Game Maker in 3D so far, uh, all the lighting, the fog, everything else, has been uh, rendered with a technique which is known as forward rendering. And what that means is that um, every time anything in the scene is vertex submitted, so all these trees, all the, uh, the player sprite, everything else, you do a bunch of transforms on the vertex position and vertex normal and whatever else happens to be in your vertex format. And then you send it over to the fragment shader and then for each pixel that is occupied on the screen by whatever you just drew, uh, you do all the lighting calculations on it, you do all the fog calculations on it, you do whatever else you want, tune shader effects, so on and so forth. And that is what ends up on the screen. And this does the job, it works, it's pretty simple to explain, the code to write it isn't that complicated. But it has a, uh, a few drawbacks in large scale games. Which is that for all the objects that you try to draw on the screen, you have to do all these lighting and fog and whatever calculations on each of those pixels all over again. Uh, every time you draw an object. And as such, the amount of lighting and fog and whatever calculations that you're doing scales up with the number of objects in your scene that you're trying to draw. And for small games, that's not really a problem, but for large open world games, uh, such as, for example, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, um, that becomes fairly... Uh, one might say that it doesn't scale up very well in large games, and of course, if you have more and more light sources, then that complexity gets even higher. And the solution to that, or at least one of the more popular solutions to that, is to instead use something called deferred rendering. And what deferred rendering is going to do is it's going to somewhat counterintuitively render multiple copies of the same scene, but they're going to be very computationally simple copies of the same scene. And each of these images is going to contain different information about the scene, which we can combine and use to reconstruct the final image. And I realized that rendering multiple copies of the same scene in order to improve performance sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but take my word for it, it's not as stupid as it sounds. There are a few downsides to doing deferred rendering in games. One is that it's a lot more work to set up up front than simple forward rendering, although it is the sort of thing where once you do it, it's done and you shouldn't really have to mess with it afterwards. And probably more relevantly to a lot of people, if you thought Alpha in 3D and Game Maker was a pain in the, pain in the neck regularly, um, it gets even worse in deferred rendering. But I'm not here to talk about whether deferred rendering is or isn't right for your game, I'm just here to talk about how you do it. So that brings us to the list of prerequisite knowledge for this video. The list is going to be a little bit on the long side this time, I'm sorry. Uh, this isn't the most advanced thing you can do in Game Maker, but it's definitely starting to get up there. Obviously you're going to want to know how the basics of 3D and Game Maker works. That's really just a given in these 3D videos now. You are going to want to know how basic lighting and fog calculations work. You are going to want to know how surfaces and textures and texture samplers and shaders and render targets and shaders work. You are going to want to be familiar with rendering depth to a texture and rendering normals to a texture. And lastly, you're going to want to know how different coordinate systems such as world space and view space and screen space relate to each other. I know this sounds like a lot, but I've made videos on all these things in the past except for how uh, different coordinate systems in like 3D space work, but I do mention them constantly in uh, the some of the other aforementioned videos, and if you've um, if you've already got a solid understanding of the other things I mentioned, then there is a good chance that at the very least you've passively uh, absorbed um, enough information about the various coordinate systems that you should be able to get by in, um, in this video. So, I really hope I didn't just scare most of you away because this is going to be fun, I swear. So the way that this is going to work is that in this video, all I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the first pass of the deferred rendering. Uh, this is going to be known as the geometry buffer. This is going to be where we simply render the uh, basic diffuse color information to a surface and the um, view space normals and the uh, view space depth to a surface. And 
If you really want to get fancy about this, then there is a ton of other information about a 3D scene that you can render to the geometry buffer, but to keep things simple, I'm just going to be going with um, diffuse color, uh, view space normals, and the, uh, the view space depth of a scene. And maybe in the future, uh, maybe even probably in the future, I will, I will take this further. But uh, for today, that's all we're going to be doing. The next video is where I'm going to combine all that information, and that's where we get to do all the fun lighting calculations and whatever. I don't have anything planned after that, but I'm sure there's going to be more eventually, uh, because um, there's a ton of fun things you can do with this with this sort of thing. The uh, the way the draw event for this game currently is set up is uh, pretty simple. So uh, we've got ourselves a list of objects. We've got a list of like uh, trees and, and the, the duck sprite and whatever. We've got a list of uh, far off terrain objects, which are rendered in the background. And uh, all the game really does is loop over them and then vertex submit them. And of course, uh, we do before we do that set the uh, the standard uh, forward rendering 3D shader, and set a bunch of relevant lighting uniforms, and um, and everything is just drawn from there. All right, I realize that my complaining about the telephone ringing while I record these videos has kind of become a running joke um, around here, but I just actually had to just get up and unplug the thing because it's actually like making it really hard to concentrate on what I'm doing. Uh, where was I? So I'm going to start off by creating three surfaces, and these three surfaces are where we're going to render the uh, diffuse color information, the normals, and the depth to. Um, these are going to be collectively known as the G buffer, or the geometry buffer. I do not remember if I said that already, because of my first explanation. Uh, so I'm going to say, uh, we're going to say self dot, I'm going to call it surface uh, G buff diffuse, and this is just going to be the regular information, what with the texture samples and the, um, the vertex color and all that. And I'm going to initialize that to negative one in the create event. This is not the create event. Um, I want to be in the create event. I want to be uh, over here. So I'm going to initialize surface gbuff diffuse to negative one in the create event. We will make sure that that actually has a value uh, soon enough. Um, Self.surf uh, gbuff normal equals negative one, and then self.surf uh, gbuff. Uh, the last one, what was the last one? Depth is going to also be equal to negative one. Uh, these do not, not actually contain surfaces yet, so I'm going to, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that they do. Uh, you can do this in the pre-draw event. Some people like to do like their rendering setup in the pre-draw event, uh, which can be found in uh, draw pre-draw over here. Um, I think to keep things simple, I'm just going to do this at the top of the regular draw event, though. Um, you know what? I like to encourage good habits in these videos, which I kind of sometimes ignore uh, for, the, for the sake of simplicity, and then I think people kind of just, like, don't think about them on their own. So I'm going to put this in pre-draw. So I've also got a, a handy utility function that I've added to this project called surface validate. And all this is going to do is it's going to make sure that a surface exists and is the correct um, width and height. And if that is the case, if the surface does exist and it does have the correct width and height, it's just going to, uh, it's not going to change anything. And if that's not the case, it's going to give you a surface with the correct width and height. And this is one of those helpful utility functions that it's nice to have in a lot of projects just um, because it's, it's nicer than typing out like surface exists and, and all that constantly. Uh, so I'm going to say self dot uh, surface gbuff depth is going to be equal to uh, surface validate. And these don't have to be in any particular order. Um, self dot surf uh, gbuff depth. Uh, the width is going to be window get width and the height is going to be window get height. It's basic, um, basic game window management stuff, and we can do the same thing for the, uh, the diffuse. It doesn't matter what order we do these in. The diffuse information surface and the normal information surface. And now we have guaranteed that, um, that all of these surfaces exist and that they are the correct size. So uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stage them. So this is where knowledge of multiple render targets really is going to be your friend. Uh, so I can say surface set target, and from here I can um, I can set the surface that we're drawing to in the shader, and the uh, the base one, the main one, I guess you could call it, uh, would be self dot surface um, surface uh, gbuff diffuse over here. 
Uh, and then for additional surface targets, there is surface set target extended. And um, you can think of the surface, the render targets as an array. And the main one that you're drawing to is uh, simply index zero in that array. And then additional ones, um, the second surface that you stage for the uh, for drawing to would be uh, self.surf gbuff. And it doesn't matter. Let's go with normals secondly. And then finally, surface set target extended um, index two in the uh, the render target array self dot surface gbuff depth and we're going to render everything in the scene to uh, to these three uh, surfaces to these three render targets um, if you feel like it you can say surface at target extended um, index zero for the regular like the main render target but you don't really have to um, Unless you just want your code to like look a certain way, I suppose, if you want it to be all formatted like that. But anyway, at the bottom, we are setting a surface target. So I'm going to also want to surface reset target. And when you, um, when you have the extended render targets like this with surface set target extended, uh, you don't have to reset any of the surfaces down there. There is no surface reset target extended function. And then, uh, this is always a good idea, before you actually start drawing anything, and I'm not doing it here, apparently. I guess I was just um, letting GameMaker take care of that for me with the application surface, but uh, draw clear to C underscore black uh, before anything is drawn, and that will just erase the contents of the surfaces, whatever was there previously is going to be erased. That way there is no, uh, no ghosting from scene to scene, no uh, Windows 95 effect, as I like to call it. Okay, I probably should, um, uh, this is going to be a lot of steps. I probably should go out of my way to, uh, get commit all this as we go instead of just doing it at the end. None of these files are selected. There we go. So if I, uh, if I run the game now, you're not going to see anything. In fact, the, the entire screen is just going to be black. There's going to be nothing on it. And that's because we're not actually uh, drawing the results of anything um, to a service that's actually ending up on the screen. Uh, we are, um, the game maker has turned off the, uh, the application surface and uh, that's being drawn manually. Uh, but the services that we're rendering to now are not being drawn manually. And I'll get to that in a minute. I actually want to write some shader code before I do all this. So let me go and uh, create myself a new shader. I'm going to call this uh, SHD Geometry. Um, it is not a geometry shader. Uh, that is something different, but it is for rendering the, uh, the geometry buffer in our, in our um, geometry pass. And here I'm going to, uh, instead of doing all, instead of uh, doing anything with the shader, the forward rendering shader, let's set this to uh, SHD geometry and I'm going to comment out all this lighting nonsense and we'll get back to that um, we'll get back to that next video this feels like a good time to full screen this editor so that there's more space uh, let's see this is for drawing the correct side of the duck uh, it's actually not drawing the correct side of the duck at certain camera angles it breaks but I don't really care that's not the point of the video um, we're going to render the player uh, we're going to render all the trees and everything and then we're going to render the terrain uh, everything so far is, uh, is pretty straightforward. Let's go into the geometry buffer, the geometry um, shader, and uh, I'm going to need to do a few things. One is I'm going to need to uh, include the vertex normal in the list of vertex attributes because we're actually going to use that. And here in the vertex shader, I'm going to need to um, I'm going to need to send a few extra variants to the fragment shader. And the variants that I'm going to need to send to the fragment shader are the view space normals and the view space depth. And um, in the past, when I've done lighting in these games, I've simply left the, um, the normals and position and everything in world space. And all the lighting calculations and everything have been done in world space. But for various reasons that I'll explain as we go, as they come up, uh, I actually want the normals that we render to be in view space, which is going to be, which is to say that I want the, uh, the normals that we render to be relative to the camera. And that's just going to make some things easier to compute. It's going to make some code easier. And it'll involve a little bit of extra work when it comes to figuring out like where in the scene the lights are and stuff because they're not going to be in world space. They're going to have to be in view space relative to the camera. But I think the, uh, the trade-off is worth it. So uh, let's define our own varyings. I can say varying uh, vec 
uh, vec3 uh, v underscore, I'll call it vs normal for vspace normal and varying uh, float uh, v underscore for varying um, vs depth for vspace depth. And uh, this is actually going to differ a little bit from the uh, rendering depth that I made a video on about a year ago for use with shadow mapping. Um, depth in that video was was scaled, so there was a higher resolution in depth for objects that were uh, closer to the camera. And that worked well enough for shadow mapping, but for this video I'm going to uh, do what is called linearize the depth. So the, uh, the depth value is going to be linear. And it won't be like skewed toward objects that are closer to the camera. And I think at least that makes my life a little bit easier when writing a deferred renderer. But if you want to go with good old gl underscore position dot z over gl underscore position dot w for your uh, your depth, and if you want to do the math that way, then uh, you can probably get away with it. So uh, let's start with view space normal. This is going to be instead of doing um, gm underscore gm underscore matrices uh, matrix world. And here I go, not knowing how to spell the word matrix again. Uh, multiplied by a vec4 containing n underscore normal and a hom homogeneous coordinate of zero. Um, this would be the world space normal, so this will be the uh, normal vector transformed into world space. But I actually want that in view space, so we can multiply that by the uh, world view matrix instead. And this will transform the normal to a um, this will transform the normal into view space instead, which is what I want. I can say v underscore vs normal is going to equal this value. And since uh, since this is a vector three, since I no longer care about the homogeneous coordinate, which is zero um, with the uh, output vector four, I can just take all this and grab the x, y, z of that. And I can pass that to the fragment shader as v underscore vs normal. Hey. Okay. Next, uh, v underscore vs depth. So the view space depth, uh, this is going to be similar. And uh, this is going to involve transforming the uh, position. So the um, object space position uh, by, into view space. So once again, we can multiply GM matrices matrix world view by the object space position, uh, which is kind of already being done over here, up here. Um, and I can, instead of grabbing this uh, X, Y, Z, uh, which would be a vector three uh, containing the v space position. All I actually need here is um, the z value, so the z coordinate, and that is going to be the distance from the camera uh, when things are transformed into view space. X is well, it depends on whether you're uh, left or right-handed, but um, in Game Maker, positive x is going to go to the right, positive y is going to go up, and positive z is going to go off away into the screen. So you can think about it in uh, much the same way as depth in the room editor. So objects with a higher uh, depth value are going to be farther away from the camera. And that's going to be view space depth. Now, if I go over to the fragment shader, I'm going to need to bring those two values back over. And I'm going to need to render to multiple render targets. So it's a bit of a long story, and I made a video on it a few weeks ago. But uh, for most of Game Maker's history, what I'm about to do wouldn't have compiled, but if you're using a version of the engine that's newer than about a year old, uh, you should be fine. So to, uh, to render the diffuse color information, which is just going to be the vertex color multiplied by whatever you get from the texture, um, to render this to a surface, you can either set that to gl underscore frag color, as we have done from, the, from like the dawn of time, uh, or you can use the gl underscore frag data array. And this is going to contain all of the surfaces that we have staged for drawing to uh, with the, uh, the surface set target extended function. Again, index 0 is going to be the uh, the main surface that we're drawing to. Index 1 is going to be um, the uh, surf underscore gbuff underscore normal. Index 2 is going to be the, uh, the, depth, the depth texture. And now we've just got the, uh, the diffuse color information without any fancy lighting or shading or anything else. Um, as for normals, and I put that in an in index 1, didn't I? I'm pretty sure I did. All right, yeah, normals are in index one. Uh, normals, if you've um, if you've ever rendered normals to a texture before, if you've ever seen the uh, the video that I made about a year ago on doing that, then uh, this is going to be exactly the same as all the other normal rendering code that you're uh, that you're familiar with. I am going to actually just copy and paste out of my um, my lesson plan project the two normal color function 
And all it's going to do is it's going to turn normals for, um, from a vector uh, which has a possible range of negative one to positive one on all of its components to a vector which has a range of zero to positive one on all of its components. Uh, so we're going to multiply it by a half to, to put the vector in a range of negative 0.5 to positive 0.5, and then we're going to add 0.5 to put it in a range of uh, zero to one. Um, and that's just going to put the normal in a, um, in a range that can be rendered nice and easily as a color. And if I want to encode that to a texture, I can say vec4 uh, uh, comprised of two normal color. And the parameter that that's going to take is just going to be v underscore vs normal. And we can give it an alpha of one. So this is not the entirety of the geometry buffer that I want to render. Um, for one, there's no alpha testing. So things like the duck sprite are going to look a little odd. But uh, for two, we're also not rendering depth yet. And that's going to be a little more complicated. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I now want to get to the point where I can run this and have something on screen. So if I, uh, if I go back to the post draw event, uh, where the application surface was being drawn. The application surface is basically not being used. You can use that as the diffuse uh, the diffuse color buffer if you want. I don't really care. I just I set up my own anyway. So I'm going to instead draw um, self.surfgbuff diffuse. And if I run the game now, we are going to have the scene without any lighting information on it. And as promised, the uh, the duck sprite is a little bit a little bit strange because we're not doing anything to account for alpha. All right. Not really uh, my favorite 2D sprite in a 3D game, but uh, we've, we're, we're getting here, and uh, we're getting there, rather. And if I were to instead render the normals, I could uh, draw a surface stretch the normal geometry buffer, and that will uh, fill the entire screen with the view space normals. And we can see that uh, if you're familiar with um, how normal maps look. The color scheme that we're seeing here might be a little bit different. Hey. Uh, normal maps are typically primarily bluish because uh, blue, the z-axis is going to be the uh, the vector that's coming out of the normal map, which um, for a flat surface will be 0, 0, 1, and uh, normal maps typically are primarily blue because the uh, adjusted normal vectors on the normal map are usually not that different from the, uh, the up vector, but uh, in our in our 3D camera, the normal vector is pointing away from us, which means that we do not get to see any blue. Uh, we, we're very little blue, at least. Um, it's mostly red on one side and uh, green on another, and in the parts of the screen where they converge, um, you get a yellowish color. So that's the normals. So would this be a good place for another commit? I guess so. A lot of the time, and you may have seen this if you've ever hung around in places like the uh, the 3D channel in the Game Maker Discord or in um, XOR's Discord server, um, but people who write deferred renderers tend to like to be able to see all of the different render targets that they have, that they're working with at the same time. So it's kind of tradition to draw each of the uh, G buffer surfaces in like the corner of the screen just so that you can see them and just so that you can see that they're doing something useful. So to, uh, to do that, I'm going to, uh, let's say, draw a surface uh, extended. I'm going to draw this at like a quarter size. Uh, the ID, the first one can be self.surf uh, gbuff um, diffuse. Uh, the position can be 0, 0. The scale, let's make it a quarter scale. So um, 0.25 on the x, 0.25 on the y. Uh, the rotation can be 0. The color can be c underscore white. Uh, the alpha can be 1. And this isn't something that you have to do, but it's a handy visual, a handy visualization to have all these on screen at once. So now we can see that uh, no matter what's in front of us, and eventually we will get to the point where we have the final 3D scene composited in front of us. Um, we also have the uh, the diffuse color information. We have the normals, and we are going to have the depth on screen on the side over here. And that's just going to allow us to see that everything is in working order. Um, let's see. So depth. And you know what, uh, because this is something that I'm probably going to forget about if I don't do it now. Um, we can do some uh, some fancy primitive alpha testing. Uh, if gl underscore frag data index 0 dot alpha is less than 0 0.1, uh, we can just discard here. Uh, this is a very simple alpha test. Um, you can get all kinds of fancy with your alpha testing, but if you include this, then the, uh, the player sprite, um, the area around it is not rendered, even if it's not like... Uh, doesn't have any pixels in it. And that's just alpha in 3D is generally awful. 
Um, and unfortunately, deferred rendering, it gets even worse in a lot of ways doing alpha in 3D, especially in Game Maker, but that's a story for another day. Now, when it comes to rendering depth, it would be nice if Game Maker had a few features that just would make this easy for us, uh, such as the ability to render to surface and texture formats that are not simply red, green, blue, alpha, 8 bits each. But since we don't have access to that, since we can't just like write raw floating point values to textures and expect them to work if they're not like within the range of a color value, we're going to need to do a little bit more work to be able to encode depth as just a number into a color. And the way that I've done that in the past is going to be uh, something that looks a bit like a function like this. Um, and it's going to take the same general shape as the two normal color function. Uh, let me capitalize that too just because everything else is capitalized here. And I, uh, I also need to copy and paste uh, the depth scale factor value. And that's just going to, uh, to be this macro over here, or this constant. And this will encode the, uh, the depth information to a color. This will encode the depth as a value from 0 to 1 to a color. And you know what? Let's just, uh, let's just do it first and see how it goes wrong, and then I'll explain. So gl underscore frag data index 2 is going to be a vec4 comprised of 2 depth color. And the input to that is going to be v underscore vs depth. And the output is going to be 1. And this is going to look a little bit nightmare fuelish. Uh, if you thought the uh, the depth as it was rendered in that rendering uh, depth to a color uh, video is a little bit nightmare fuelish, it gets even worse here. So uh, yeah, the color that you're seeing there is basically a nonsense value. Uh, the two depth color, as I wrote it in the rendering depth to a texture video, is expected to be between a range of 0 and 1. And that number between 0 and 1 is multiplied by the uh, maximum 24-bit uh, integer uh, to put it in a range of 0 to 16, 7, 7, 7, 2, 15. And then that's basically just uh, broken up into individual um, individual 8-bit sections and encoded as a color. Uh, but if you're going to multiply an already large number uh, between, say, 0 and however far away the farthest thing on the screen is um, by, by that number, uh, this is just going to turn into a garbage value and it's not going to be any relevant information about the scene. So instead, I'm going to, um, I'm going to want as a uniform the... Uh, the far clipping plane value, so this is going to be the farthest thing in, away in the scene that can be rendered as defined by the uh, camera Z far over here. And um, once again, this uh, probably shouldn't be hard coded in this camera, camera projection over there, but I'll work with it. I'm going to set this as a uniform, so let's say uniform uh, float u underscore I'll call it camera Z far. And in the draw event, I can set a shader uniform uh, that is going to be uh, belonging to the shader geometry, uh, the geometry path shader. It's going to be uniform uh, U underscore camera Z far. And it's going to have a value of 16,000 16, because that is my far clipping plane for this, uh, for this camera. And again, if you're really creating a a system to make a 3D game, you would not hard code this, but I'm going to hard code this. And then um, we can divide depth here. Um, say depth divided by uh, u underscore camera z far. And that is going to put the depth value in a range between 0 and 1, uh, because the, uh, the depth value that you get from the vertex shader can't be greater than the camera's uh, far clipping plane because anything farther than that will not be rendered. Um, I'm going to call this, uh, let's say float normalized depth because we, uh, we put it in a range of zero to one. And then um, from there, uh, we should be able to proceed as normal because then we have a number between zero and one, we're multiplying that by the depth scale factor and then everything uh, else should be the same. I should mention that when I was doing research for this, I came across some mentions that certain um, certain rendering, certain graphics APIs uh, will have depth away from the camera be negative. So the um, this value, um, matrix worldview multiplied by object-based position, the Z value for that will be negative. I have not personally encountered that myself, but it may be a good idea to use a little absolute value function here to ensure that this value is a positive number. 
uh, because if it's a negative number, then that's going to throw off the rest of this calculation. Uh, this is going to come up again in the deferred pass when we get to that in the next video, but um, let's just leave it like that for now. And now, when I run the game, we should have a, a, a set of colors in the, um, the depth part of the geometry buffer that looks like something useful, and that does not appear to be the case. All right, what went wrong? Um, we're taking depth divided by the far, the far distance. Uh, we are multiplying that by the depth scale factor, which is this huge number, 24 bits. Am I passing in the wrong value for the uh, camera Z far? Oh, I misspelled it. That would do it. Yeah, I am. Um, all right, that's a lot better. So now we've got we've got colors in the um, the depth part of the geometry buffer over here that are approximately um, the same like type of colors that you saw in the uh, the shadow mapping video uh, when it came to the depth buffer. And uh, things that are very close to the camera are going to be like a uh, very red and green bandish, banded ish. And then if, as you get farther away, um, things such as the far off mountains are a little bit more on the blue side because uh, the blue is the um, basically the largest bits that go into the, uh, the depth pass. If I were to get really far away from you, that color should turn bluish white. Anyway, enough of that. So that is going to be uh, pretty much it for setting up the geometry buffer, which is good because uh, this value, t this video took a lot longer to um, to get out than I thought it would. There were a lot of things that I uh, had to do multiple takes on because I didn't really like how I how I said them the first time. Uh, so I'm going to commit the rest of these changes to source control uh, render render depth to the G buffer. And I'm going to end things off here. So next time, we are going to get into combining uh, these three um, surfaces, these three pieces of information about the scene into, um, into the final scene in the deferred part of the deferred rendering system. I'll probably do fog, directional lights, and point lights in that video. I don't think I'll do spotlights because by the end of that video, um, spotlights won't be anything new. It'll just be the regular spotlight math, but applied with the... Uh, the information that we that we have at our disposal in the deferred rendering pass and i don't really want to spend another 15 minutes in the video just doing something that um you can probably figure out like that until then uh, my name is michael i like wizards and dragons and making games if you want the code for this look for the github repository down in the video description i try to post about two game dev videos a week that might be a little bit sparse for the next few weeks because the, the christmas holidays are coming up and i'm gonna not have a lot of time for this and then i'm gonna magfest so i'll be away for for a bit but regardless, if you're interested in any of the weirder things you can do in Game Maker, and I certainly think this qualifies, feel free to subscribe. I have a Patreon, so if you want to contribute to the channel, links to that can be found in all the usual places. Otherwise, I hope you all enjoyed this, and I will see you all later. Special thanks to Army Armbuster, DJ Gibbles, Edward Holt, Game Maker, Harold Guidry, Jonathan Bernardez, Kiexi, Cinder Larson, Square Crow, The Oz, and Zenjamin for supporting these videos. If you want to support the channel, head on over to the Patreon page down in the video description to join the fun.